Life is filled with choices. We can go to dozens of uh, stores uh, in this town, grocery stores. Once we get inside, we'll find hundreds of kinds of foods and products. It's mind-boggling. With the array of choices that we have today with foods, uh, cars, houses, airlines, uh, that can carry over into the realm of religion. The problem with multiple choices when it comes to what we believe is we get kind of this cafeteria effect where we pick and choose what we want and end up putting all beliefs on the same plane. The notion that all beliefs have equal validity in getting us to God is very popular today. Into our culture that embraces the notion that one belief is as good as another comes Jesus Christ who says, read this with me, this is one of his uh, very famous lines, but it's also most controversial, very unpopular today. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In our series, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said, you say, come on. Jesus says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you kidding me? Jesus says, I am the gate. He says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, enter through the narrow gate. Jesus teaches there is only one way to God, and it's through him. Maybe you're not a Christian. You say, yeah. That's what I hate about Christians. I mean, I don't understand how you Christians can claim that Jesus is the only way when there are four billion people in the world who are Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, or atheists, or of other faiths. You are so narrow-minded. I mean, you may be a Christ follower and you say, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross, rose from the grave. But this thing about him being the only way, ah. In our text today, Matthew 7, 13 to 23, if you want to follow along, we have Bibles under the seats. It's on page 971. Jesus tells us to enter through the narrow gate. He calls us to follow him and his teaching. For he is the only way to God. He simplifies the plethora of choices to one. We must choose between two gates, two roads, two destinations, and two crowds of people. Read with me what Jesus says. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Most people, Jesus say, says, journey through life on a road that requires no commitment. I mean, if all roads lead to God, well, then it really doesn't matter which road you go on, right? All, everything's equal. It's the easy way, Jesus says. And since it's the popular way to go, you only need to follow the crowd. Now, many people object to this narrowness of Jesus' claim to be the only way to God. The interesting thing is that people don't object to narrowness in other important areas of life. Science is very narrow. Suppose you're a chemist and you take your crew into the lab and you say, today we're going to make water. Oh dear. I can't remember. Is water H2O or is it H4O? Well, I'll tell you what. We'll just say it's H3O. I mean, no scientist would do that. You can't do that in your lab. Science is very narrow. When we calculate the trajectory to take a rocket that's gone from the moon and back, we have to be very narrow. We calculate it down to the milliseconds in order to make re-entry possible. Nobody objects to science being narrow. 
Or how about romance? Let's say you go to the University of Oregon or Oregon State and you meet a girl and you date and you have a wonderful relationship and you say to her one night, Susan, it's so wonderful being, getting to know you and uh, I think we've got a great future and I, I love that you live in a house with all these other girls, or a dorm with all these other girls and tell you what, why don't you introduce me to every one of the other girls and I'll take a different one out each week. Uh, we'll still go out on Saturday nights. We'll still do that. But on Friday nights, I'll take a different girl each week. I mean, what girl's going to put up with that? It's, it's, it's not romantic to have all these different girls. It's the narrowness that makes it romantic. Or suppose you hire somebody to, to, to do a job in your house and he, he comes and quickly cuts the board and puts it up on your mantle and it doesn't quite fit. He says, oh, well, close enough. Close enough. I mean, that's right up there with the doctor uh, in the middle of surgery who says, oops. <laughs> or a dentist in the middle of a procedure and he says, uh oh. I mean, that's what you're taught in medical school never to say. We expect professionals in their area of extra expertise to hold to very high standards of narrowness. This narrowness is what Jesus teaches. He says he is the only one who can give us life. In this most important matter, our Lord teaches that we must enter through the narrow gate. Let's examine the choice Jesus offers us. First, there are two gates. Read this with me again. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. On the one hand, there is the wide gate. There's no problem getting through this gate for you don't have to leave anything behind. You can take as much luggage as you want. You don't have to give up your personal beliefs. We don't need to relinquish our selfishness or pride. It's a wide entryway. In contrast, there's the narrow gate. To enter through this gate, we must leave our extra luggage behind. We must set aside our personal beliefs as to how one gets to God and follow Jesus. We must leave our selfishness, self-will, and pride behind. Instead, we give ourselves to Jesus Christ. Everyone can find the wide gate, but one has to look for the narrow gate. It's easy to miss. How can we find it? The narrow gate is Jesus Christ himself. We come to Jesus. Now, you may wonder, does Jesus mean that Entering through the narrow gate means that his, he is, it's a very narrow way. I don't want this narrow-minded stuff. I don't want to be, live a life inhibited by all these things I can't do. Well, Jesus says you enter through a narrow gate. Through him. But once you get through that, you open into an expansive world. As long as we live in God's will, we have a, a, all kinds of choices we can make. We come through him and then we're uh, freed from our sins and our uh, selfishness and we are open to all kinds of uh, choices in life. Jesus says there's only one way to God. It's through him. Second, there are two roads. There's plenty of room on the broad road for diversity of opinion, laxity in morals. It's a road of tolerance and permissiveness. Has no curbs, no boundaries. There are no speed limits. You can drive as fast as you like. Travelers need not practice self-control and discipline. No effort need to be made to eradicate selfishness and pride. That's why it's called the broad road. This broad road is the politically correct thinking of our day. It is taught in practically all universities in our country. Practically all universities uh, teach that there are no moral absolutes. Morals are up to you. And since there are no absolutes, 
And one way is as good as another. You don't need to make any choice. Everything works. That's why Jesus calls this the broad road. It's easy. Requires no commitment, no choice. You can comfortably drift. In contrast, Jesus' road is the hard road. It's more difficult, but it requires discipline to travel this road. It, it imposes limitations on what we believe and how we behave. Parents, your most sacred responsibility is to lead your children to Christ. If you don't speak up, if you don't insist that your kids come to church and get involved with our youth group and our kids' space, you're almost guaranteeing that your sons and daughters will be sucked into the broad road that believes all beliefs are equal and all lead to God. Third, there are two destinations. The one destination is destruction. Ignoring Jesus Christ leads to self-destruction in this life and culminates in hell in the next. There's a town in Norway called Hell. It's a tourist attraction because of the name. A Lutheran family uh, traveled there and uh, they emailed their pastor and they said, we just went to hell today and we're concerned. Almost everyone here seems to be Lutheran. <laughs> the reality of hell should break our hearts and drive us to our knees for the people in our lives, our family and friends, co-workers and classmates who we don't think know Christ. Today, however, hell has become the H word. Nobody ever mentions it rarely talked about. But we need to talk about it because we have a problem. For every American who believes he's going to hell, there are 120 who believe they're going to heaven. This optimism stands in stark contrast to Jesus' words that warn us that many are on the road to hell. Many imagine that it's civilized, humane, and compassionate to deny the existence of hell. But in fact, it is arrogant that we as creatures would dare to take what we think is the moral high ground in opposition to what Jesus taught. Some, some people think it's unloving to talk about hell. But think about it. If friends asked you for directions to San Francisco and you knew there's one road that leads right into the city, but there's another road that leads to a sharp cliff and it comes around a blind corner, would you only tell them about the one road or would you tell them about both? The more loving thing to do would be to tell them about both, especially if you knew that the road that leads to a sharp cliff is wider. When thinking about the destination our road is taking us to, I find it helpful to play the movie forward. If I continue on the path I'm on, where will my road lead to? I mean, the bag of cookies and chips may taste good today, but play the movie forward. Where will it lead? I may not like what I see. I could end up 50 pounds heavier. Playing the movie forward helps you see where your life will end up if you continue down the path you are on. We don't end up where we hope to end up. We ultimately end up where the path we are on is leading. So we have to be diligent about who and what we align ourselves with. Because whatever or whomever we saddle up with is going to determine where we arrive months or years from now. Fourth, there are two crowds. Through the wide gate, we find the crowd of many. There are many travelers on this easy road. It's the way most people go. But the security of many travelers won't, won't mean anything when the end is destruction. By comparison, Jesus tells us only a few choose to go through the narrow gate. He chooses, that, he chooses that those who choose to take the narrow gate will be in the minority. 
Most people that count uh, the world by world religions estimate that one third of the people in the world are Christian. But by my guess, nearly half of those are nominal Christians, Christians in name only. That means only one sixth of the people in the world are followers of Jesus Christ. To become a follower of Christ, we must leave the popular way of the crowd and go it alone. Jesus says we all have a choice to make. To choose, to not choose is not an option. Either we choose to follow Jesus or we go our own way. There are only two gates. There are only two roads. There's no middle way. There are only two destinations. There's no third alternative. There are only two crowds. There's no neutral group. You either are for Christ or against him. You can't be neutral about Jesus. Once we enter through the narrow gate of commitment to Jesus, our choices are not over. For Jesus tells us along the road we will encounter false prophets. Watch out for false prophets, Jesus says. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The false prophets will say things like, you can't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Come on. It's 2017. It's not 1452. I mean, get with it. You can't believe that there are moral absolutes. Come on, get with it. With everybody else, join us on the broad road. So Jesus tells us a fifth choice we must make. Recognize what is true and what is false. One reason we need to watch out for false prophets is because what is false is deceptive. Jesus tells us they come to us in sheep's clothing. They appear to be innocent. They appear like they are leading you to Jesus, but their real purpose is to lead you away from Christ. False teachers don't announce that they are propagators of lies. They may use the language of the Bible, but they mean something quite different. Another reason we must watch out for false prophets is because what is false is dangerous. Jesus says, inwardly they are ferocious wolves. False prophets are extremely dangerous. How can we recognize false prophets? Jesus says, what is true bears good fruit. Read this with me. These are some of Jesus' famous words. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A tree cannot hide its identity for long. Eventually, it will betray what kind of tree it is by the fruit it bears. You evaluate people, Jesus says, by the fruit in their lives. The Apostle Paul says, look at their character. He says, the fruit of the Spirit, this is a, uh, also a very well-known verse. Read this with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the character qualities we should find in people who are sold out to following Christ. You also evaluate them by what they do. Jesus goes on. Read this with me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly. Remember, Jesus loves to use hyperbole. He takes this extreme example of people who seem to know him. They even perform amazing miracles. But they're rejected because they didn't obey him. How do we look for fruit in people's lives? We do it by 
careful and thorough examination. Judging a tree by its fruit is not necessarily easy. You can't tell in the winter time what kind of fruit, a, what kind of tree it is. You have to wait until summer. And you can't tell from a distance. From a distance, the fruit looks fine. You have to get up close. We test false prophets by doing a thorough examination of their character. If we want to know who entered through the narrow gate of Christ, we look for fruit in their lives. The narrow way of Christ bothers many people. It may bother you. But if you read the New Testament, you can't miss it. The Apostle Paul writes, read this with me, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Paul says there is only one way. There's only one Son of God. C.S. Lewis grapples with this in his Narnia tales. When I was a little boy, my mom read the, all seven Narnia tales to me and my sister. I was in fourth grade. I loved it. Maybe you've seen The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I think one of the best of the Narnia tales is The Silver Chair. Jill and Eustace are running around the school. They're being chased by some bullies. And so to get away, they run through the gym and they go out the back door to the meadow behind the school. But when they come out the door, they're not in the back of the schoolyard. They're not even in London anymore. They've come into Lewis's magical Narnia. Eustace has been there before, so he's anxious to show Jill around. And they come to a, a cliff that looks down, and Jill learns that Eustace is afraid of heights, but she's not. So she goes right up to the edge, and when she gets there, she wishes she hadn't come so close. She looks down, and she sees these specks of white. They're clouds, and below them are, is earth. She begins to get faint and dizzy, so Eustace grabs her and pulls her back, but as he does so, he slips and falls off. If that's not bad enough, all of a sudden a huge lion comes alongside Jill. As she's lying there in the grass crying, she hears the bubbling sound of water through a brook. Listen to Lewis. If you are thirsty, you may drink. It was the lion who spoke. The lion in the Narnia Tales represents Jesus Christ. Of course, she remembered what Eustace had said about animals talking in that other world and realized that it was the lion speaking. Anyway, she had seen its lips move this time, and the voice was not like a man's. It was deeper, wilder, and stronger, a sort of heavy, golden voice. Are you not thirsty, said the lion? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do, said Jill? The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to... Do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. If Jesus Christ is not the stream, then what stream do you propose? When Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he's not bragging. Nor is he threatening. He simply states a fact. He is the only Son of God, the only one that can bridge us to the Father. There is no other way. You must grapple with Jesus' claim. If life is not found in his stream, then where are you going to drink?
Where are you going to get your sins forgiven? We like to think that we're not so bad and God will let us into heaven, but it doesn't work like that. If anyone in the world is going to be saved, it has to be through Jesus Christ, the only way the Father has given us. Because he's the only one who has disarmed sin, evil, and death. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior of the world? Have you entered through the narrow gate, given your life to him? A husband asked his daughter if uh, she'd like to go on a picnic. She said, sure. And so they made sandwiches and fruit and packed a, a lunch basket. Then he went to get his wife. She says, oh, honey, I'm so busy. I got all this stuff to do. You guys go ahead without me. And so they did. They got in the car and they drove out to this beautiful place in the country with a gorgeous view. And after lunch, they drove until the sun set. They got home and two days later, he had a heart attack and died. And the wife says to this day, I always regret that I didn't go with them on that day. Our time is limited. If we believe there is only one way to God and that Jesus is the only way to forgiveness, true happiness in this life and eternal life with God in the next, we have to increase our passion. We don't have forever to tell people. This is a life and death matter. Jesus sends us out to rescue our family and friends and classmates and co-workers from hell. When it comes to sharing Jesus, I'd rather go down swinging than to just come to the plate and stand there. I challenge you to pray for God to help you and be led by the Holy Spirit and give you opportunities to share Jesus with your friends and family members. And if he gives you an opportunity to, to tell them what Jesus means to you, invite them to church. Maybe invite them to one of our Christmas Eve services, 2.30 or 4 on Christmas Eve. If they come, they'll hear about Jesus. And there's a reasonable chance they may enter through the narrow gate and begin on the path of following Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for your words. They're not very popular today. At first look, we say, oh, come on. You're the narrow gate. You're the only way. But we see that you claim to be the only Son of God, the only one that can give us forgiveness of sin and break through evil and death. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you say, I've, I've heard enough today. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, and thank you for dying for my sins. Would you come into my life? You can do that right now. Or maybe you're a follower of Christ, and you say, Jesus, I see this is serious. I want to be more passionate in sharing you with the people in my life. that I'm pretty sure they don't know you. Give me more boldness. Give me more willingness to step out. You pray right now. You tell him what you're thinking. Lord Jesus, we, <clears throat> we believe in you, that you are the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Help us to take that seriously and care enough about the people in our lives that we share them about you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.